Welcome to 3ABN Spring Camp Meeting 2017, Exposing the Counterfeit. Hello and welcome to Spring Camp Meeting 2017. Thank you so much for joining us via the television, Can't Forget Radio, maybe even the internet, but thank you for joining us. Have you been blessed? I know I have. Boy, did you hear the audience here? I didn't even ask them yet. Have you guys been blessed? Hey. I have it too. And you know, the days are long in a good way. And the nights are short in a good way, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I end up being tired in the day, but that's okay because it's a great thing. And you know, we just appreciate each one of you being here and our live audience here at 3ABN. But thank you for joining us. I know, I wish that each one of you could join us, but I know sometimes you can't. But thank you for joining us via the airways. It's always a blessing. You know, uh, my dad and I like to backpack, and we backpack, went backpacking in Kentucky a few, a few weeks ago. And um, we ate our lunch on the, on the log, uh, set our you know, sandwiches and stuff on the log. We took our packs off because we were tired. And uh, after we had packed up all of our stuff, uh, I noticed on the uh, log this little thing just crawling along. You know what it was? It was a little ant. I heard somebody say that. It was a little ant, and do you know what he was carrying? Part of my lunch. <laughs> It was just a little crumb that I left from a granola bar or something. But do you know the lesson I learned from that? The little ant wasn't just sitting there eating the crumb. You know what he was doing? He was carrying it along. So I can just imagine he's carrying it to his little ant family. And they were all going to share this together. And I think the thing with camping is, you know, we get spiritually fed here. But the key is we take back those morsels, right? and share them with our families wherever they are, whether they're Seventh-day Adventist, Christian, or even just someone you've never met before or seen before, but maybe in Walmart or something. That's the key. And as we share, we'll grow, right, spiritually. And so with camp meeting, boy, it's a spiritual high, isn't it? But boy, we have to make sure that we go and share what Jesus has given to us to all these wonderful speakers. And this morning we have evangelist, speaker, director, Stephen Wolberg. How many of you are familiar with Stephen Wolberg? Oh, yeah, me too. And uh, they have a, a little studio up toward the Canadian border, border in the state of Idaho. I've never been there, but he tells me it's beautiful. He has two children, Seth, who's 12, Abby, 9, and, of course, his wife, Kristen. And I asked Pastor Steve, I said, so what's the purpose of White Horse Media, which is what he's speaker director of? And I like this. He said, it's the purpose is to prepare others for Christ's soon return. Well, isn't that great? Hopefully all of us, that's our mission, to hasten Christ's soon return. Before he comes and speaks, we have uh, some music by Celestine Berry and her daughter, Farah. And the song that they're going to be sharing with us is Lift Up Your Hands. We appreciate both of them very much, Farah and her mother. They're members of our local Thompsonville Seventh-day Adventist Church, our local family here. But thank you so much for sharing. After the music, the next voice you'll hear will be Pastor Steve Wolberg. It's not that all that that my friend
Hello, 3ABN, 3ABN family. It's great to be here. What a blessing and an honor and a privilege. Uh, Greg mentioned the little ant who took his food when he was backpacking and brought it to his family. And as he mentioned, uh, I'm a family man, and maybe I'll look uh, at the camera and hello, Seth. Hello, Abby. Hello, Kristen, if you're watching from North Idaho. Hello from Dad. God is good. Uh, I want to thank James Rafferty for filling in for me this morning. Uh, I had some travel woes yesterday. I was supposed to speak at 9.30 today, but we had some uh, delayed flights. And anyway, that uh, wasn't my doing, but it was weather and the airlines. And uh, got into St. Louis last night at around midnight. The car rental place was closed. But we knew that in advance, and so somebody from, uh, Bob from 3ABN came and picked me up and got me to the hotel somewhere around 2, and I just needed a little more time to just get myself organized, and um, my good friend James Rafferty decided to switch with me, so that was a blessing, a big blessing. So again, it's great to be here. Uh, if you have a Bible, I invite you to open up to the book of Matthew, chapter 16, and you can see my talk behind me is Peter the Rock Upon Which the Church Was Built. Uh, I'll make a confession. This is the first time I've spoken on this subject, so I'm definitely going to be re relying heavily on the Lord. Uh, I've written a little pocket book on this topic that's just coming out. It's called, Is God's Church Built on Peter? I'll talk more about this as we uh, go along. This is a big subject, bigger than appears on the surface. And so 
we need to pray. Uh, I know that the devil doesn't want me to give this presentation, but uh, praise Jesus Christ that the Lord is stronger than the devil. Amen. We always need to remember that, don't we? Amen. In the middle of the trials and the struggles of life. And as we get closer to the Lord's coming, I tell you, things are going to get even more intense. But Jesus is uh, very powerful. All power is given to him in heaven and on earth. And, on earth and what a wonderful day it will be when he finally returns and his face is shining like the sun. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I'd like to kneel before we start. We've got a lot to do. So just bow your heads and let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, this is your time. Thank you for bringing me here safely in spite of my... Uh, delayed flights, here I am, and we pray for your blessing, for the Holy Spirit, for your power to anoint this message and to open all of our hearts that we will see Jesus as our Savior. Please help me. I'm just flesh and blood. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Okay. Is Peter the rock upon which the church is built? The Roman Catholic Church is the oldest, it is the largest, it is the wealthiest, and it is the most uh, politically active and the most powerful church on planet Earth right now with approximately 1.29 billion members. At this moment, as we all know, the leader of uh, the Roman Church is Pope Francis. In 2013, Time Magazine selected Pope Francis as its Person of the Year. In June of 2015, the Vatican released his encyclical on climate change, which is now guiding government leaders, politicians, environment, environmentalists, and scientists around the globe. In September of 2015, Pope Francis addressed the United States uh, Congress, a joint session of Congress. He also spoke before the United Nations uh, and in Philadelphia. He is often referred to even by media as the Holy Father and as His Holiness. I'm sure you've, you've heard those phrases that are often used. It's amazing to discover that uh, Pope Francis has now become the most popular person on planet Earth above any other politician, talk show host, musician, or sports hero. Wow, can you imagine being the most popular human on the planet? That's a lot of, uh, that's just a lot, a lot to deal with for anybody. On May 24, President Trump met with Pope Francis during his tour, uh, his overseas tour to Saudi Arabia. He met with the uh, Palestinians, he met with the Israelis, he met with Muslim leadership, and then he went to the Vatican, and he met with the Pope in his apostolic palace in Rome. One news commentary, uh, commentator describing that meeting said that it was between possibly the two most powerful men in the world. Uh, shortly, shortly thereafter, uh, President Trump's wife, Melania, after meeting with the Trump, she decided to go public with the fact that she is a Roman Catholic, and this was reported by news agencies uh, around the world. It's very interesting that uh, President Trump is a Presbyterian. His wife is Catholic. His daughter, Ivanka, is uh, Jewish. She keeps the Sabbath. And in his circle of advisors, he also has Dr. Ben Carson, who is a Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> so that's quite a group. And it's just going to be very interesting to see how all of this plays out in the days ahead. I don't think any of us know which uh, decisions, you know, individuals are going to make during the final events. None of us know. And for the record, I want to make it very clear that nothing that I say in this talk uh, is designed to be any kind of an attack upon uh, individual Catholic people. That's for sure. Uh, there are many, 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 many sincere, godly uh, Roman Catholics who are going to be in the kingdom of God. I believe that with all my heart. Uh, God loves us all, and personally, I believe he, he loves the Pope too. Now, I know some people would question that, but I don't. Uh, I believe that he loves him, and he loves, he loves everybody. He loves everybody. The big issue that we're going to explore today has to do with the issue of truth, 
and the issue of uh, counterfeit, which is what this whole spring camp meeting is all about, right? Have you been enjoying this camp meeting? Yeah. It's pretty exciting. Yeah. Pretty exciting. Uh, a Fox News article that was published May 24, 2017, re referring to President Trump's meeting with Pope Francis, referred, and I'll quote, to Francis's, quote, 2013 elevation to the throne of Peter. That was right in uh, Fox News. His elevation to the throne of Peter when he became Pope. It's amazing to realize that Pope Francis's global influence and his global authority as the most popular person on planet Earth who meets with the President of the United States. The Vatican has diplomatic relations with approximately 180 countries around the world. That um, his influence and his mystique as the, quote, Holy Father and as His Holiness is rooted in the Roman Catholics, Catholic Church's interpretation of primarily one Bible verse, one Bible text, which is Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Matthew 16, verse 18, where Jesus Christ said these words. He said, I also say to you that you are Peter. He was talking to Peter. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades or hell shall not prevail against it. These are the words of Jesus. Now, the Roman Catholic Church uh, interprets this verse to mean that Peter is the rock upon which the church is built, God's church is built. And this comes from official Catholic sources uh, from their 1994 uh, Catholic catechism, so this is no secret that they believe that when Jesus was here on earth with his 12 disciples, that he made Peter the rock and the head of his church. He made Peter the first pope. And he gave Peter tremendous spiritual authority. He gave him the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And that this authority, according to the Roman church's interpretation of this text and the verse after it, uh, this authority is transferable from Peter to the bishops and the leaders of Rome, to the popes of Rome, down throughout Christian history, all the way down to the current Pope Francis. That's why Fox News said that Pope Francis was elevated in 2013 to the throne of Peter. So that's the idea. That's the concept. Now, the question that we are going to uh, ask today and we're going to look at from our Bible is, is this interpretation of this passage correct? Uh, it's the Roman Catholic view, which is shared by over a billion people on this planet, sincere people, godly people. Uh, is this really right? Or is it possible that this is uh, a counterfeit? That's what this camp meeting is all about, right? truth or counterfeit, exposing the counterfeit. If it is true, then when Pope Francis speaks, we should all listen. If it's not true, then somebody needs to enlighten him and others as to the facts. So that's the issue. So let's go to Matthew 16 and let's take a look at our Bibles. Matthew 16. The whole context is in verses 13 to 20. So let's take a look at the Word of God and see what the Bible says. Sound good? Amen. See how big this issue is? It's very big. Verse 13, the Bible says, then, I'm sorry, it says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, which was a region uh, northwest of Jerusalem, he was with his disciples and he said to them, he said, he asked his disciples and he said, he asked them a question. 
He said, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? That was the question that Jesus asked his disciple. Now, point number one, notice carefully that uh, this question reveals that the issue that Jesus is raising is his own identity, right? He's asking his disciples, who do, who do men, what are you hearing from others? Who do they think that I am? And we don't know exactly which disciple said what, but in verse 14, so they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. That's what men are saying about you, Jesus. That's what the disciples said. Now, in the next verse, Jesus gets a little more pointed. And then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And that's a big question. And once again, I want you to uh, realize that the focus of Jesus at this point is on his own identity. It's who is he? Who do the disciples think that he is? And, I, and let me ask you, who do you think that Jesus is? Uh, this, this question has eternal consequences for each one of us. What do we believe about Jesus Christ himself? Big, big, big question for the whole world to contemplate. Who really is Jesus? Well, in verse, uh, in verse 16, Peter gives an answer. Simon Peter answered and he said, and this is a wonderful answer. <laughs> it's the truth, it's not a counterfeit. Simon Peter answered and he said, you are who? You are the Christ, the Son of of the living God. Wow. That's a marvelous answer. And Peter was telling the truth. Uh, and in fact, when you read the next verse, we discover that Peter really couldn't take credit for giving Jesus the right answer. That this was not anything that he should boast about, that he should, you know, pat himself on the back about and think that he was special about because in the very next verse, Jesus answered and said to him, he said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Isn't that tremendous? Jesus said, Peter, you've given me an answer that is... Uh, is an answer that comes from God. It's a revelation that comes from, from my Father in heaven through you. It's not just your flesh, your, your weak, sinful, human, mortal flesh that has taught you this. It's, uh, it's, it's my Father, it's God himself. And these are revelations that we need, wouldn't you agree? We, we cannot afford to trust human flesh, flesh and blood. Flesh and blood is weak. Jesus Christ is the son of the living God, and we get that knowledge through revelation, through revelation from the Holy Spirit and from God. Now, in the next verse, verse 18, here we get to the, the key controversial text. Verse 18, Jesus said, and I also say to you, <clears throat> now the you is Peter, he's talking to Peter, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, here's the issue. Here's the core issue upon which the authority, the spiritual authority of Pope Francis uh, rises or falls. It's either upheld or it collapses. And it's based on the core issue of who really is the rock. Is the rock Peter? Did Jesus Christ build his church on Peter? 
is the authority that Jesus gave to Peter transferred down throughout history through Roman popes uh, to the present Pope Francis? Or is the rock the Lord Jesus Christ himself? Amen. Who is the rock? Well, let's start out by just looking a little closer at the sentence structure. Verse 18, Jesus said, I say to you that you are Peter and on this rock. Now notice, Jesus did not say, I say to you that you are Peter and on you I will build my church. Jesus did not say that. He did not say on you I will build my church. He said on, on this rock I will build my church. And as we look at this more carefully, uh, his statement on this rock implies something separate from Peter. He said, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now, the Greek word for Peter, the uh, New Testament was originally written in Greek. The original Greek word for Peter is Petros, Petros. And the word for rock is a different Greek word and is Petra. Petros, Peter, Petra, rock. And if you look at Strong's Concordance, this is how these Greek words are defined. Petros is defined, for Peter, is defined as a stone or pebble, such as a small rock found along a pathway. Petra means, quote, a huge mass of rock, a boulder, such as a projecting cliff. And you can see that uh, in the, the name of the city of Petra. You ever heard of the city of Petra? It's a city in the Middle East that comes out of a massive outcrop of rock. The city of Petra. Petra means massive, immovable outcrop of rock. So we have Jesus saying, you are Peter, Petros, meaning a, a pebble, and on this rock, Petra, I will build my church. Now, uh, Roman Catholic theologians have definite answers to that line of reasoning. Roman Catholic theologians, and this is right on many uh, websites, many statements, what their, their response to this, this distinction between Peter and the rock, is this. They'll say, yes, it's true that the Greek words Petros and Petra are different. They'll acknowledge that. But then they will say, they will say, but, but, Jesus, when he was here, he spoke Aramaic. And in Aramaic, the word for Peter is kipha, and the word for rock is kipha. And so, Catholics will interpret this to mean, since Jesus spoke Aramaic, what he really spoke was, you are Kepha, and on this Kepha, I will build my church. And their conclusion is that Peter is the rock, based on the Aramaic argument. Now, here's my response to the Aramaic argument. My response is, uh, yes, Jesus probably did speak Aramaic when he was here. We know that he also spoke Hebrew. We know that from Acts 26, verse 14, where he spoke to Paul, the Bible says, in the Hebrew language. He probably spoke Latin, which was the main Roman language, and when Jesus was alone with Pontius Pilate, and they had a conversation. Jesus probably spoke Latin to him. He probably spoke Greek as well, which was a very common language in the Roman Empire. Uh, when Jesus, at that time, when Jesus died, if you remember, there was a sign that was placed over his head. Do you remember that? Pilate uh, had that sign put up there. This is from John 19, verses 19 and 20. And it says that this was written in the Hebrew and the Greek and the Latin that this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. So you've got Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. It's interesting that uh, Pilate didn't put Aramaic on there as well. I don't know why, but he didn't. So the question is, uh, what language, 
was Jesus speaking when he spoke to the disciples and when he said, you are Peter. What language? Do you want to know the truth? I'll tell you the truth. The truth is that we don't know because we weren't there. <laughs> nobody really knows because nobody now living was there. But here's something that we do know, that we know for sure, and that is that the New Testament text was originally written in Greek. We know that. And we also know from 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, that it is the text, it is the scripture that is inspired by God. Amen. 2 Timothy 3, 16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. So we shouldn't build our case on what language Jesus may or may not have spoken because we don't know. We should build our case on the word of the Lord, Amen. the word of God. Jesus Christ uh, always followed the scripture. And we do know that the scripture makes a distinction between Petros, pebble, and Petra, boulder. We know that the text makes that distinction. And Jesus always followed scripture. He was very, very careful in everything he did to follow the word. In the same book of Matthew, if you go back uh, 12 chapters earlier when Jesus was in the wilderness fighting with the devil, not with fists, but he was uh, in a conflict, a fierce conflict with the enemy of souls. And Jesus resisted Satan's infernal temptations. And he resisted it how? What did he say? He said, it is written. Matthew 4, 4. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus upheld, it is written. He upheld the text. He upheld the scripture as inspired by God. Now, what does the scripture outside of Matthew 16, verse 18, what does the scripture say about the rock? Who is the rock according to the Bible? Psalm 18, verse 2. Psalm 18, verse 2. David tells us who the rock is. In Psalm 18, verse 2, he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. We can trust the Lord, the rock. Now turn to Isaiah chapter 44. This is a very powerful text. Isaiah 44 Verse 18. No, verse 8. Isaiah 44, verse 8. This is God talking here. He says, the Lord says, Do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. His people are to witness to him. And notice what he says about himself. You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other what? There is no other rock. No other. I know not one. So here the Lord is talking about himself. He says, you're my witnesses to this fact. He says, there, there is no other rock but me. And, he's, and God says, I don't know of any other. It's just me. It's me alone. Now think about this. 
If, if Jesus, when he spoke to Peter in Matthew 16, 18, and said, I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, if Jesus meant that Peter was now the rock, then Jesus Christ would be denying the word of God. He'd be denying the scripture. He'd be denying what is, what is written. And if he denies the scripture and denies the word of God, then he would be committing a sin. And if Jesus committed a sin, then his perfect life is marred. And then guess what? Guess what the, uh, the ramifications and the consequences of that would be to you, to me, to every Roman Catholic, to every Protestant, to every Baptist, to every Jew, to everybody all over the world, the consequence, whether people believe in Jesus or not, the consequences would mean that the entire plan of salvation has fallen apart and that nobody has any hope even if people don't believe in Jesus, hopefully they can become believers in Jesus. But if that was true, if, that, if Jesus was denying the word, then there would be no hope for anybody according to the scripture. But we know that according to the scripture, that's not the case. Let's go back to Matthew 16. According to the scripture, there is only one rock. And according to the scripture, Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. He never said anything contrary to God's word. He was never wrong. He never made a mistake. And at the end of his life, he gave his life on a cruel cross for the sins of the whole world. So he, as, as the Bible says, he is the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. And as James mentioned earlier, we have life. All of us have life because of the sacrifice of Christ. Now, when you go back to Matthew 16, it's very clear that the entire context of these verses, and of verse 18 and 19, the whole context is the identity of who? It's Jesus, right? Jesus said, who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Peter gave the right answer, and Jesus said, Peter, you are blessed. You're blessed. You didn't get that right answer from your own weak flesh and blood. This answer has come from God. It's come from my Father. It's a revelation through you, and it's, it, is, it is the truth. Think about it. Why would Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, shift gears in Matthew 16, 18 and decide that he's going to build his entire church on a man that's not him, on a weak, frail, erring, sinful, fallen, mortal man? Why would Jesus do that? It doesn't, make, it doesn't make any sense that Jesus would do that. And if you look back at the text, Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades or hell shall not prevail against it. Shall not prevail against my church. Isn't that a great text? Is our church under fire? Is God's church under attack today? Yes. Is God's church going down? No. Does God's church have a foundation? Yes. Are the gates of hell waging war yes. against the people of God today? Yes. No doubt. And where is our trust? Is, is it in flesh and blood? No. Are we trusting in man? You see, the, you know, there's a bigger issue here, isn't there? There's the Peter issue, there's the Catholic issue, and then there's your issue, and there's my issue, and there's the church issue. 
This is a huge, huge issue. And Jesus said that the gates of hell would not prevail against his church that is built on the rock. Amen. That is built on the rock. Now, uh, the gates of hell did prevail sometimes, numerous times, against Peter. It did. Uh, in fact, if you go down, we don't have really time to read this whole thing right now, but in verses 21 to 23, Jesus, right after this, told his disciples he was going to Jerusalem to die. And then Peter, who may have been a feeling a little self-exalted because he gave the right answer, then told Jesus in verse 22, he said, no, he began to rebuke the Lord. Lord, you're not going to Jerusalem to die. We're going to defend you, which if Jesus wouldn't have gone to Jerusalem to die, the whole plan of salvation would have collapsed. And what did Jesus say? He turned and he said to who? He said to Peter. He said, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. So Peter, at this point, was not acting very rock-like, that's for sure. Uh, he, was, he actually became a mouthpiece for the devil because he was following his own selfish ways and he couldn't imagine that his master would end up on a cross outside Jerusalem. So he tried to uh, prevent Jesus from doing this and he became a mouthpiece for the devil. Uh, in Matthew 26, verse 74, we know that Peter ended up denying the Lord three times before the rooster crowed, three times. He denied him three times, right? And then he went out and he wept bitterly because the Holy Spirit convicted him of what he had done. He had denied the Lord. But thankfully, Jesus is very good and very patient and very forgiving and very kind and very merciful. And the Lord forgave Peter for his sin and he continued to work in his life and to change his life. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down with power and used Peter to lift up the cross. Amen. To lift up the cross. Peter had learned his, his lesson. The Bible is very clear from Psalm 18, verse 2. It's from Isaiah, chapter 44, verse 8. And there are other verses that there's only one rock. There's only one rock, and that is the rock of ages. And the rock of ages is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. Nobody else is like Him. Nobody else is like Him. And as we move into stormy times and into struggles where the devil is turning everything loose against God's church, we need to know where the rock is upon which we stand. Amen. Are you with me? We cannot afford to trust in flesh and blood. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, Paul talks about the rock. And if you recall who he says the rock is, 1 Corinthians 10, 4, he talked about the Israelites traveling in the wilderness and about the rock that they drank from. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, Paul, looking back through the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit, he said they drank from that spiritual drink, the same spiritual drink, they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was who? Christ. Was Christ. That's right. And guess what Greek word Paul used for rock in 1 Corinthians 10, 4? It was Petra, same Greek word that uh, Matthew used in Matthew 16, verse 18. Petra, an immovable, 
massive boulder that cannot, cannot be shaken. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 8, Peter also himself talked about the rock. 1 Peter 2, verse 8, and I'll show you what he said. He talks, he's quoting the Old Testament. And he talks about a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And who is that rock? It's very clear from the scripture. Verse 4 says, coming to him, to Jesus, as to a living stone, indeed rejected by men, but chosen by God as precious. And it is the Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what word Peter used in verse 8 for rock? Guess what Greek word? Petra, meaning a massive outcrop of rock, a boulder. Now let's go back to Matthew 16. I can see my time is moving. I've got a, about 11 minutes left until I am done. So I've got a lot of things to share with you, and I don't really have time to go into uh, all the details. Uh, this little book is God's church built on Peter, has scriptures, background, history, quotations, and it is loaded with information. So I'm just going to give you uh, just a few of the highlights. In verse 19, Jesus said, I will give to you, referring to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, the Catholic Church believes that Peter exclusively, exclusively was given the keys of the kingdom and that uh, those keys have been transferred from Peter to the bishops of Rome to the popes of Rome down throughout history and, and that Pope Francis himself has the keys. Uh, when you compare this verse with Matthew 18, verse 18, Jesus is talking to all the disciples and he uses the same language to all of them. He says, assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Same words. In Matthew 16, verse 19, he addressed Peter. In Matthew 18, verse 18, he used the same words, not just for Peter, but for all of the disciples. What are the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What are those keys? Uh, again, I don't have time to go into a lot of texts, but if you look at uh, John chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, these words are spirit and they are life. Uh, in this little book is God's church built on Peter. We have, I have other scriptures in here that builds a case solidly that the keys of the kingdom are none other than the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Jesus' words open and close heaven. Jesus' words can raise the dead to life. Jesus' words can change our hearts. Jesus' words are powerful. And I've learned through... <laughs> A lot of trials and ups and downs and ins and outs of being a Christian and being a Seventh-day Adventist minister, I have learned the Lord has taught me a big lesson. And that lesson is that I cannot afford to trust in flesh and blood. I cannot afford to trust in the things of men. I cannot afford to trust in the sayings of man, the ways of man, the opinions of man, the theories of man, the teachings of man, the interpretations of man, Ultimately, my hope must be built on Jesus Christ and on his own words, Amen. his words. It was Jesus who said, I give to you the keys. Those were his own words that he was speaking. His words are powerful. His words open the gates of paradise. I'm hoping that this little book is God's church built on Peter, that this will be a missionary book to reach some of the 1.29 billion Roman Catholics in this world who are very sincere, who are very honest, who are many of them very godly, 
and who, uh, who need a closer relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, for the 3ABN audience, this book is available from 3ABN. It just came out. Uh, it is now actually in the process of being translated into Italian so that it can be given out freely in Rome. <laughs> and I'm hoping that somebody will give this to Melania Trump <laughs> and maybe even give it to Pope Francis. You know, there's a lot of people out there that are very sincere, that are searching, that need more light. In fact, we all need the Lord Jesus Christ. I need him, you need him, everyone needs him. If you go back to Matthew chapter 16, after verse 19, verse 20 says, right after he finished his words, Jesus says, then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he, that he was Jesus the Christ. So it starts with the question of who he is, what men say, what the disciples say, then it goes to the rock, and then it concludes with the, with the statement that he is Jesus the Christ. He's the Christ, the son of the living God. Now Jesus told his disciples at that time not to spread it around because at that time, he didn't want to create a lot of opposition from the Pharisees unnecessarily. But that time, uh, where people should keep it quiet, is over. Now, we need to know. We all need to know. You need to know, I need to know, the world needs to know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he is the rock of our salvation. He's the only hope that we have and he is a solid rock, and his words, his own words, and the text, what is written, is a, is a power that opens the doors of eternity. We all need Jesus. I need him so much. Uh, let me just share with you a quick quote from the 1994 Roman Catholic Catechism. Referring to Peter, this is what it says. This is uh, the 1990, 1994 Official Roman Catholic Catechism, section 882, says the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, and Peter's successor, Peter's successor, as pastor of the entire church, has full, supreme, and universal power over the whole church, a power which he can always exercise unhindered. Wow. Does the Pope have a universal power over the whole church, a power which he can exercise unhindered, which is full and supreme? Is that true? Or is that a counterfeit? I tell you, based on the word of God, Jesus Christ alone has full, supreme authority over his church. Amen. It's only Jesus Christ Amen. and his word, his word, the word of God. And he wants to have that authority over your life. Amen. He wants to have that authority over my life. Giving Jesus full and total authority over our lives, this is the key to gaining the kingdom of heaven. This is the key to standing in the storm. This is the key to going through the closing hours of human history. This is the key that we need. Peter, every Roman Catholic, every Protestant, every Presbyterian, every Jew, every Seventh-day Adventist, all Republicans, all Democrats, atheists, witches, agnostics, everybody in this world has the same basic human nature. We all have basic flesh and blood. And the only way to get the victory over the basic human nature that we all have, which really, you know, goes back to Lucifer, is self-exalting, exalting self, making individual men to be more important than God the only 
way to get the victory over this is through full surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. We all need that. I need that every, every, every day. The entire Roman Catholic structure that says that Peter was the first pope and that Pope Francis now sits upon the throne of Peter based on the word of God, it is a counterfeit. It is not the truth. And don't miss this point. When any one of our human natures, following the example of Peter when he told Jesus not to go to Jerusalem and die, uh, when he became a mouthpiece for the devil, when any one of our natures chooses to follow self above Jesus Christ and his word, then we have become counterfeit Christians. Wow. It can happen to any one of us. It can happen to all of us. Jesus is the rock of ages. I'd like to close. I see I've got one minute left on my clock here. I want to close with a poem. It's actually a hymn. Many of us know this hymn. It's called, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less Than Jesus' Blood and Righteousness, written by Edward Mote in 1834. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before his throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. <laughs>